Good Sabbath, everyone, and uh, welcome to uh, this uh, study today. Uh, today is Sabbath, June 25th, 2022, and we're going to continue uh, in our, uh, what we began last week in the book of Job, and we're going to continue studying with this uh, being part two. Um, it's possible we might finish today or do one more session. I don't think we'll be more than three in any case, but we'll go as far as we can today and then take it from there. So um, you'll recall that last week we read through in our Bible Hour One uh, session, we read through the first 20 chapters. And today we're going to pick up with uh, chapter 21 and we'll read through the end of the book of Job. So if uh, you could just follow me on screen, if you don't want to bring up your own, your own Bible version. So let me bring it up on screen and um, we'll take it beginning in verse uh, in chapter 21. And then today I'll be doing some additional deeper, more, you know, more in-depth commentary on what we find as we, uh, as we look at the, at the book in its entirety. Again, I'm reading from, as I did last week, from the NRSV, the New Revised Standard Version. And uh, I'm going to begin with chapter 21. Just a quick point. Remember that we're in the middle of dialogues that Job is having with his friends, just to give you a little context of where we left off. So the last thing that we saw uh, was in, uh, in chapter 20, we saw Zophar, uh, the third friend. You had... The, the, the three friends uh, who, were, uh, who were speaking to Job and uh, the last one that had spoken before we, we left off was, uh, was Zophar. So you have Eliphaz, the first friend, Bildad, the second, and Zophar, the third. And uh, Zophar had just finished speaking and Job was about ready to answer. And that's where we are in Job 21. Then Job answered, Listen carefully to my words, and let this be your consolation. Bear with me, and I will speak. Then after I have spoken, mock on. As for me, is my complaint addressed to mortals? Why should I not be impatient? Look at me and be appalled, and lay your hand upon your mouth. When I think of it, I'm dismayed, and shuddering seizes my flesh. Why do the wicked live on, reach old age, and grow mighty in power? Their children are established in their presence and their offspring before their eyes. Their houses are safe from fear and no rod of Elohim is upon them. Their bull breeds without fail. Their cow calves and never miscarries. They send out the little ones like a flock and their children dance around. They sing to the tambourine and the lyre and rejoice to the sound of the pipe. They spend their days in prosperity and in peace they go down to Sheol. They say to Elohim, leave us alone. We do not desire to know your ways. What is the Almighty that we should serve him? What profit do we get if we pray to him? Is not their prosperity indeed their own achievement? The plans of the wicked are repugnant to me. How often is the lamp of the wicked put out? How often does calamity come upon them? How often does Elohim distribute pains in his anger? How often are they like straw before the wind and like chaff that the storm carries away? You say, Elohim stores up their iniquity for their children. Let it be paid back to them so that they may know it, that their own eyes see their destruction and let them drink of the wrath of the Almighty. For what do they care for their household after them when the number of their months is cut off? Will any teach Elohim knowledge, seeing that he judges those that are on high? One dies in full prosperity, being wholly at ease and secure, his loins full of milk and the marrow of his bones moist. Another dies in bitterness of soul, never having tasted of good. They lie down alike in the dust and the worms cover them. Oh, I know your thoughts and your schemes to wrong me. For you say, where is the house of the prince? Where is the tent in which the wicked lived? Have you not asked those who travel the roads? And do you not accept their testimony? That the wicked are spared in the day of calamity and are rescued in the day of wrath? Who declares, uh, who declares, their way to their face, and who repays them for what they have done? When they are carried to the grave, a watch is kept over their tomb. The claws of the valley are sweet to them. Everyone will follow after, and those who went before are innumerable. 
How then will you comfort me with empty nothings? There's nothing left of your answers but falsehood. Chapter 22. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered, Can a mortal be of use to Elohim? Can even the wisest be of service to him? Is it any pleasure to the Almighty if you are righteous, or is it gain to him if you make your ways blameless? Is it for your piety that he reproves you or enters and enters into judgment with you? Is not your wickedness great? There's no end to your iniquities. For you have exacted pledges from your family for no reason and stripped the naked of their clothing. You have given no water to the weary to drink and you have withheld bread from the hungry. The powerful possess the land, the favored lived in it, live in it. You've sent the widows away empty-handed and the arms of the orphans you have crushed. Therefore, snares are around you, and sudden terror overwhelms you, or darkness so that you cannot see. A flood of water covers you. Is not Elohim high in the heavens? See the highest stars, how lofty they are. Therefore, you say, what does Elohim know? Can he judge through the deep darkness? Thick clouds enwrap him so that he does not see, and he walks on the dome of heaven. Will you keep to the old way that the wicked have trod? They were snatched away before their time. Their foundation was washed away by a flood. They said to Elohim, leave us alone, and what can the Almighty do to us? Yet he filled their houses with good things. But the plans of the wicked are repugnant to me. The righteous see it and are glad. The innocent laugh them to scorn, saying, surely our adversaries are cut off, and what they left the fire has consumed. Agree with Elohim and be at peace. In this way, good will come to you. Receive instruction from his mouth and lay up his words in your heart. If you return to the Almighty, you'll be restored. If you remove unrighteousness from your tents, if you treat gold like dust and gold of Ophir like the stones of the torrent bed, and if the Almighty is your gold and your precious silver, then you will delight yourself in the Almighty and lift up your face to Elohim. You will pray to him and he will hear you and you will pay your vows. You will decide on the matter and it will be established for you and light will shine on your ways. When others are humiliated, you say it is pride, for he saves the humble. He will deliver even those who are guilty. They will escape because of the cleanness of your hands. Chapter 23. Then Job answered, Today also my complaint is bitter. His hand is heavy, despite my groaning. Oh, that I knew where I might find him, that I might Come even to his dwelling. I would, I would lay my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would learn what he would answer me and understand what he would say to me. Would he contend with me in the greatness of his power? No, but he would give heed to me. There an upright person could read with him, reason with him. And I should be acquitted forever by my judge. If I go forward, he's not there. Or backward, I cannot perceive him. On the left, he hides and I cannot behold him. I turn to the right but I cannot see him. But he knows the way I take that I take. When he has tested me, I shall come out like gold. My foot is held fast to his steps. I have kept his way and have not turned aside. I have not departed from the commandment of his lips. I have treasured in my bosom the words of his mouth. But he stands alone, and who can dissuade him? What he desires, that he does. For he will complete what he appoints for me, and many such things are in his mind. Therefore, I am terrified at his presence. When I consider, I am in dread of him. Elohim has made my heart faint. The Almighty has terrified me. If only I could vanish in darkness and thick darkness would cover my face. Chapter 24. Why are times not kept by the Almighty? And why do those who know him never see his days? The wicked remove landmarks. They seize flocks and pasture them. They drive away the donkey of the orphan. They take the widow's ox for a pledge. They thrust the knee off the road. The poor of the earth all hide themselves. Like wild asses in the desert, they go out to their toil, scavenging in the wasteland food for their young. They reap in a field not their own, and they glean in the vineyard of the wicked. They lie all night naked without clothing and have no covering in the cold. They are wet with the rain of the, on the, of the mountains and cling to the rock for want of shelter. There are those who snatch the orphan child from the breast and take as a pledge the infant of the poor. They go about naked without clothing, though hungry. They carry the sheaves. Between their terraces, they, they press out oil. They 
tread the wine presses, but suffer thirst. From the city, the dying groan, and the throat of the wounded cries for help. Yet Elohim pays no attention to their prayer. There are those who rebel against the light, who are not acquainted with its ways and do not stay in its paths. The murderer rises at dusk to kill the poor and needy, and in the night is like a thief. The eye of the adulterer also waits for the twilight, saying, no, I will see me, and he disguises his face. In the dark, they dig through houses. By day, they shut themselves up. They do not know the light. For deep darkness is morning to all of them. For they are friends with the terrors of deep darkness. Swift are they on the face of the waters. Their portion in the land is cursed. No treader turns toward their vineyards. Drought and heat snatch away the snow waters. So does Sheol those who have sinned. The womb forgets them. The worm finds them sweet. They are no longer remembered. So wickedness is broken like a tree. They harm the childless woman and do no good to the widow. Yet Elohim prolongs the life of the mighty by his power. They rise up when they despair of life. He gives them security and they are supported. His eyes are upon their ways. They are exalted a little while and then are gone. They wither and fade like the mallow. They are cut off like the heads of grain. If it is not so, who will prove me a liar and show that there is nothing in what I say? Job 25. Then Bildad the Shuite answered, Dominion and fear are with Elohim. He makes peace in his high heaven. Is there any number to his armies? Upon whom does his light not arise? How then can a mortal be righteous before Elohim? How can one born of woman be pure? If even the moon is not bright and the stars are not pure in his sight, how much less a mortal who is a maggot and a human being who is a worm? Then Job answered, how you have helped one who has no power. How you have assisted the arm that has no strength. How you have counseled one who has no wisdom and given much good advice. With whose help have you uttered words and whose spirit has come forth from you? The shades below tremble, the waters and their inhabitants. Sheol is naked before Elohim and Abaddon has no covering. He stretches out Zephon over the void and hangs the earth upon nothing. He binds up the waters in his thick clouds and the cloud is not torn open by them. He covers the face of the full moon and spread over it his cloud. He has described a circle on the face of the waters at the boundary between light and darkness. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astounded at his rebuke. By his power, he stilled the sea. By his understanding, he struck down Rahab. By his wind, the heavens were made fair. His hand pierced the fleeing serpent. These are indeed but the outskirts of his ways, and how small a whisper do we hear of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? Job again took up his discourse and said, As Elohim lives, who has taken away my right, and the Almighty who has made my soul bitter, as long as my breath is in me, and the spirit of Elohim is in my nostrils, my lips will not speak falsehood, and my tongue will not utter deceit. Far be it from me to say that you are right. Until I die, I will not put away my integrity from me. I hold fast my righteousness and will not let it go. My heart does not reproach me for any of my days. May my enemy be like the wicked and may my opponent be like the unrighteous. For what is the hope of the wicked when Elohim cuts them off, when Elohim takes away their lives? Will Elohim hear their cry when trouble comes upon them? Will they take delight in the Almighty? Will they call upon Elohim at all times? I will teach you concerning the hand of Elohim, that which is with the Almighty I will not conceal. All of you have seen it yourselves. Why then have you become altogether vain? This is the portion of the wicked with Elohim and the heritage that oppressors receive from the Almighty. If their children are multiplied, it is for the sword, and their offspring have not enough to eat. Those who survive them, the pestilence buries, and their widows make no lamentation though they heap up silver like dust and pile up clothing like clay they may pile it up but the just will wear it and the innocent will divide the silver they build their houses like nests like booths made by sentinels of the vineyard they go to bed with wealth but will do so no more they open their eyes and it is gone terrors overtake them like a flood in the night a whirlwind carries them off the east wind lifts them up and they are gone it sweeps them out of their place. 
It hurls at them without pity. They flee from its power in headlong flight. It claps its hands at them and hisses at them from its place. Surely there's a mine for silver and a place for gold to be refined. And by the way, I'm going to stop here because I want to point out what's happening here. So Job 28 is a is an important chapter and i i believe i mentioned last time that if i were looking for the the key center of this entire book it would be here at job 28 which i think is the heart of the book um opinions vary among scholars as to who is speaking here in this chapter in job 28 and the most likely explanation that i have heard is that this is not job speaking it doesn't match what he's saying in 27 or in 29 when he ends the one dialogue in 27 and when he picks up on the first discourse in 29. The, the tone is not right. It's not the same. Now, some people will argue that it is, in fact, Job speaking. I think it's actually the narrator, whoever is doing the narrating. And we'll talk a little bit more about the narrator later when we talk about the structure of the book. But I believe it's the narrator with an interlude here. And this is a pivot point. We're pivoting from one part of the argument, going into a new section of the argument. So here's Job 28, and pay close attention because like I said, this is, in my opinion, the heart of the book. Surely there's a mine for silver and a place for gold to be refined. Iron is taken out of the earth and copper is smelted from ore. Miners put an end to darkness and search out to the farthest bound, the ore and gloom and deep darkness. They open shafts in a valley away from human habitation. They are forgotten by travelers. They sway suspended, remote from people. As for the earth, out of it comes bread, but underneath it is turned up as by fire. Its stones are the place of sapphires and its dust contains gold. That path no bird of prey knows and the falcon's eye has not seen it. The proud wild animals have not trodden it. The lion has not passed over it. They put their hand to the flinty rock and overturn mountains by the roots. They cut out channels in the rocks and their eyes see every precious thing. The sources of the rivers they probe, hidden things they bring to light. But where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Mortals do not know the way to it and it is not found in the land of the living. The deep says, it is not in me, and the sea says, it's not with me. It cannot be gotten for gold, and silver cannot be weighed out at this price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Gold and glass cannot equal it, nor can it be exchanged for jewels of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or of crystal. The price of wisdom is above pearls. The chrysolite of Ethiopia cannot compare with it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. Where then does wisdom come from? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death say, we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. Elohim understands the way to it and he knows its place for he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything under the heavens. When he gave to the wind its weight and a portion out the waters by measure, when he made a decree for the rain and a way for the thunderbolt, then he saw it and declared it. He established it and searched it out. And he said to humankind, truly the fear of Yahweh, that is wisdom. And to, and to depart from evil is understanding. And now we're back into Job's initial discourse, right? What is the difference between the discourse and a dialogue? Dialogue is two, right? At least two. Talk, one talks, one listens, the other talks, the other listens, back and forth. A discourse is more like a monologue, right? So now we go from a series of three cycles of, disc of dialogues to a series of three cycles of discourses. The first two are, uh, excuse me, the first one is by Job, the second is by a new friend, friend who's going to appear, and the third one is by Yahweh himself. So Job again took up his discourse and said, uh, and by the way, again, uh, one more comment here. Um, 
so Job is making his case to his friends, right? He's responding to their accusations in the, in the first section of, uh, uh, of uh, dialogues. And by the time we get to chapter 28, Job has pretty much had it and said, this is a waste of my breath. I'm going to take my case directly to Elohim. He's been talking to Elohim also. He's been in his words. He's also been addressing Elohim. So he starts out by responding to something that's foolish that they said, and he, you know, he reacts to it. And then you hear him kind of musing out loud, right? Musing about, well, Elohim, I've brought you this, and I've done this, and I've done that, and I, where are you? You're not hearing me, and blah, blah, blah. And he's, it's almost like he's talking to himself in front of his friends. But now he's just pretty much just addressing Elohim in his discussion, or at least even if he's with his friends, he's talking to Elohim. Job again took up his discourse and said, oh, that I were as in the months of old, as in days when Elohim watched over me, when his lamp shone over my head, and by his light I walked through darkness, when I was in my prime, when the friendship of Elohim was upon my tent, when the Almighty was still with me, and my children were around me, when my steps were washed with milk, and the rock poured out for me streams of oil, when I went out to the gate of the city, when I took my seat in the square, the young men saw me and withdrew, and the aged rose up and stood. The nobles refrained from talking and laid their hands on their mouths. The voices of princes were hushed, and their tongues stuck to the roofs of their mouths. When they, the ear heard, it commended me. When the eye saw, it approved, because I delivered the poor who cried and the orphan who had no helper. The blessing of the wretched came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and they clothed me. My justice was like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind and feet to the lame. I was a father to the needy, and I championed the cause of the stranger. I broke the fangs of the unrighteous and made them drop their prey from their teeth. Then I thought, I shall die in my nest, and I shall multiply my days like the phoenix. My roots spread out to the waters with the dew all night on my branches. My glory was fresh with me and my bow ever new in my hand. They listened to me and waited and kept silence from my counsel. After I spoke, they did not speak again. And my word dropped upon them like dew. They waited for me. As for the rain, they opened their mouths as for the spring rain. I smiled on them when they had no confidence, and the light of my countenance they did not extinguish. I chose their way and sat as a chief, and I lived like a king among his troops, like one who comforts mourners. Chapter 30. But now they make sport of me. Those who are younger than I, whose fathers I would have disdained to set with the dogs of my flock. What could I gain from the strength of their hands? All their vigor is gone. Through want and hard hunger, they gnaw the dry and desolate ground. They pick mallow in the leaves of bushes and to warm themselves the roots of broom. They are driven out from society. People shout after them as after a thief. In the gullies of wadis, they must live in holes in the ground and in the rocks. Among the bushes, they bray. Under the nettles, they huddle together a senseless, disreputable brood. They have been whipped out of the land. And now they mock me in, me in song. I'm a byword to them. They abhor me. They keep aloof from me. They do not hesitate to spit at the sight of me because Elohim has loosed my bowstring and humbled me. They have cast off restraint in my presence. On my right hand, the rabble rise up. They send me sprawling and build roads for my ruin. They break up my path. They promote my calamity. No one restrains them. As through a a wide breach they come, amid the crash they roll on. Terrors are turned upon me. My honor is pursued as by the wind, and my prosperity has passed away like a cloud. And now my soul is poured out within me. Days of affliction have taken hold of me. The night racks my bones, and the pain that gnaws me takes no rest. With violence, he seizes my garment. He grasps me by the collar of the tunic. He has cast me into the mire, and I become like dust and ashes. I cry to you, and you do not answer me. I stand, and you merely look at me. You have turned cruel to me. With the might of your hand, you persecute me. You lift me up on the wind. You make me ride on it, and you toss me about in the roar of the storm. I know that you will bring me to death and to the house appointed for all living. 
Surely one does not turn against the needy when in disaster they cry for help. Did I not weep for those whose day was hard? Was not my soul grieved for the poor? But when I looked for good, evil came. And when I waited for light, darkness came. My inward parts are in turmoil and are never still. Days of affliction come to meet me. I go about in sunless gloom. I stand up in the assembly and cry for help. I'm a brother of jackals and a companion of ostriches. My skin turns black and falls from me and my bones burn with heat. My lyre is turned into mourning and my pipe to the voice of those who weep. I've made a covenant with my eyes. How then could I look upon a virgin? What would be my portion from Elohim above and my heritage from the Almighty on high? Does not calamity befall the unrighteous and disaster the workers of iniquity? Does he not see my ways and number all my steps? If I've walked with falsehood and my foot has hurried to deceit, let me be weighed in a just balance and let Elohim know my integrity. If my step is turned aside from the way, my heart has followed my eyes. And if any spot has clung to my hands, then let me sow when another eat and let what grows for me be rooted out. If my heart has been enticed by a woman and I have lain in wait at my neighbor's door, then let my wife grind for another and let other men kneel over her. For that would be a heinous crime. That would be a criminal offense. For that would be a fire consuming down to Abaddon and it would burn to the root all my harvest. If I have rejected the cause of my male or female slaves when they brought a complaint against me, what then shall I do when Elohim rises up? When he makes inquiry, what shall I answer him? Did not he who made me in the womb make them? And did not one fashion us in the womb? If I have withheld, withheld anything that the poor desired, or have caused the eyes of the widow to fail, or have eaten my morsel alone, and the orphan is not eaten from it, for from my youth I reared the orphan like a father, and from my mother's womb I guided the widow. If I have seen anyone perish for lack of clothing, or a per poor person without covering, whose loins have not blessed me, and who was not warmed with the fleece of my sheep. If I have raised my hand against the orphan because I saw I had supporters at the gate, then let my shoulder blade fall from my socket and let my arm be broken from its socket. For I was in terror of calamity from Elohim and I could not have faced his majesty. If I had made gold my trust or called fine gold my confidence, if I have rejoiced because my wealth was great or because my hand had gotten much, if I had looked at the sun when it shone or the moon moon in splendor and my heart enticed and my mouth has kissed my hand, this also would be an iniquity to be punished by the judges for I should have been false to Elohim above. If I have rejoiced at the ruin of those who hated me or exulted when evil overtook them, I have not let my mouth sin by asking for their lives with a curse. If those of my tent ever said, oh, that we might be sated with his flesh, the stranger has not lodged in the street. I have opened my doors to the traveler. If I have concealed my transgressions as others do by hiding my iniquity in my bosom, because I stood in greater fear of the multitude and the contempt of families terrified me so that I kept silence and did not go out of doors. Oh, that I had one to hear me. Here is my signature. Let the almighty answer me. Oh, that I had the indictment written by my adversary. Surely I would carry it on my shoulder. I would bind it on me like a crown. I would give him an account of all my steps like a prince I would approach him. If my land has cried out against me and its furrows have wept together, if I have eaten its yield without payment and caused the death of its owners, let thorns grow instead of wheat and foul weeds instead of barley. The words of Job are ended. Chapter 32, so these three men ceased to answer Job because he was righteous in his own eyes. Then Elihu, son of Barachel the Buzite of the family of Ram, became angry. He was angry at Job because he justified himself rather than Elohim. He was angry also at Job's three friends because they had found no answer, though they had declared Job to be in the wrong. Now Elihu had waited to speak to Job because they were older than he. But when Elihu saw that there was no answer in the mouths of these three men, he became angry. Elihu, son of Baruch the Busite, answered, I am young in years, and you are aged. Therefore, I was timid and afraid to declare my opinion to you. I said, let days speak, and many years teach wisdom. But truly, it is the spirit in a mortal 
the breath of the Almighty that makes for understanding is not the old that are wise, nor the aged that are that understand what is right. Therefore, I say, listen to me. Let me also declare my opinion. See, I waited for your words. I listened for your wise sayings while you searched out what to say. I gave you my attention, but there was in fact no one that confuted Job, no one among you that answered his words. Yet do not say we have found wisdom. Elohim may vanquish him, not a human. He has not directed his words against me, and I will not answer him with your speeches. They are dismayed. They answer no more. They have not a word to say. And am I to wait because they do not speak, because they stand there and answer no more? I also will give my answer. I also will declare my opinion. For I am full of words. The spirit within me constrains me. My heart is indeed like wine that has no vent, like new wineskins that's ready to burst. I must speak so that I may find relief. I must open my lips and answer. I love this guy. I will not show partiality to any person or use flattery toward anyone, for I do not know how to flatter, or my maker would soon put an end to me. Chapter 33. But now hear my speech, O Job, and listen to all my words. See, I open my mouth, the tongue in my mouth speaks. My words declare the uprightness of my heart, and what my lips know, they speak sincerely. The spirit of Elohim has made me, and the breath of the Almighty gives me life. Answer me if you can. Set your words in order before me. Take your stand. See, before Elohim, I am as you are. I too was formed from a piece of clay. No fear of me need terrify you. My pressure will not be heavy on you. Surely you have spoken in my hearing, and I have heard the sound of your words. You say, I'm clean without transgression. I'm pure and there is no iniquity in me. Look, he finds occasions against me. He counts me as his enemy. He puts my feet in the stocks and watches all my paths. But in this, you are not right. I will answer you. Elohim is greater than any mortal. Why do you contend against him? Saying he will answer none of my words. For Elohim speaks in one way and in two, though people do not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on mortals while they slumber on their beds, then he opens their ears and terrifies them with warnings that he may turn them aside from their deeds and keep them from pride, to spare their souls from the pit, their lives from traversing the river. They are also chastened with pain upon their beds and will, with continual strife in their bones so that their lives loathe bread and their appetites dainty food. Their flesh is so wasted away that it cannot be seen, and their bones, once invisible, now stick out. Their souls draw near the pit, and their lives to those who bring death. Then, if there should be for one of them an angel, a mediator, one of a thousand, one who declares a person upright, and he is gracious to that person and says, Deliver him from going down into the pit. I have found a ransom. Let his flesh become fresh with youth. Let him return to the days of his youthful vigor. Then he prays to Elohim and he's accepted by him. He comes into his presence with joy and Elohim repays him for his righteousness. That person sings to others and says, I sinned and perverted what was right and it was not paid back to me. He has redeemed my soul from going down to the pit and my life shall see the light. Elohim indeed does all these things two, three times with mortals to bring back their souls from the pit so that they may see the light of life. Pay heed, Job, listen to me. Be silent and I will speak. If you have anything to say, answer me. Speak, for I desire to justify you. If not, listen to me. Be silent and I will teach you wisdom. Job 34. Then Elihu continued and said, Hear my words, you wise men, and give ear to me, you who know. For the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose what is right. Let us determine among ourselves what is good. For Job has said, I am innocent. And Elohim has taken away my right. In spite of being right, I am counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am with transgression, without transgression. Who is there like Job, who drinks up scoffing like water, who goes in company with evildoers and walks with the wicked? For he has said it profits one nothing to delight, to take delight in Elohim. Therefore, Hear me, you who have sense. Far be it from Elohim that he should do wickedness, and from the Almighty that he should do wrong. For according to their deeds, he will repay them, and according to their ways, he will make it befall them. Of a truth, Elohim will not do wickedly, and the Almighty will not pervert justice. Who gave him, him charge over the earth, and who laid on him the whole world? If he should take back his spirit to himself and gather to himself his breath, all flesh would perish together, and all mortals return to the dust. If you have understanding, hear this. Listen to what I say. Shall one who hates justice govern? 
Will you condemn one who is righteous and mighty? Who, who says to a king, you scoundrel, and to princes, you wicked men? Who shows no partiality to nobles, nor regards the rich more than the poor? For they are all the work of his hands. In a moment they die. At midnight the people are shaken and pass away, and the mighty are taken away by no human hand. For his eyes are upon the ways of mortals, and he sees all their steps. There is no gloom or deep darkness where evildoers may hide themselves. For he has not appointed a time for anyone to go before Elohim in judgment. He shatters the mighty without investigation and sets others in their place. Thus, knowing their works, he'll return them in the night, and they're crushed. He strikes them for their wickedness while others look on, because they turned aside from following him and had no regard for any of his ways, so that they cause the cry of the poor to come to him. And he heard the cry of the afflicted. When he is quiet, who can condemn? When he hides his face, who can behold him, whether it be a nation or an individual? So that the wicked should not reign or those who ensnare the people. For has anyone said to Elohim, I have endured punishment, I will not offend anymore? Teach me what I do not see. If I've done iniquity, I will do it no more. Would he then pay back to suit you because you rejected? For you must choose and not I. Therefore declare what you know. Those who have sense will say to me, and the wise who hear me will say, Job speaks without knowledge. His words are without insight. Would that Job were tried to the limit, because his answers are those of the wicked. For he adds rebellion to his sin. He claps his hands among us and multiplies his words against Elohim. Job 35. Elihu continued and said, do you think this to be just? You say, I am in the right before Elohim. If you ask, what advantage have I? How am I better off than if I had sinned? I will answer you and your friends with you. Look at the heavens and see. Observe the clouds, which are higher than you. If you have sinned, what do you accomplish against him? And if your transgressions are multiplied, what do you do to him? If you are righteous, what do you give to him? Or what does he receive from your hand? Your wickedness affects others like you and your righteousness other human beings. Because of the multitude of oppressions, people cry out. They call for help because of the arm of the mighty. But no one says, where is Elohim my maker, who gives strength in the night, who teaches us more than the animals of the earth and makes us wiser than the birds of the air? There they cry out, but he does not answer because of the pride of evildoers. Surely Elohim does not hear an empty cry, nor does the Almighty regard it. How much less when you say that you do not see him, that the case is before him and you are waiting for him. And now because his anger does not punish and he's, he does not greatly heed transgression, Job opens his mouth in empty talk. He multiplies words without knowledge. Elihu continued, excuse me, uh, Job 36. Elihu continued and said, bear with me a little and I will show you. For I have yet something to say on Elihu. <laughs> I will bring my knowledge from far away and ascribe righteousness to my maker. For truly my words are not false. One who is perfect in knowledge is with you. Surely Elohim is mighty and does not despise any. He is mighty in strength of understanding. He does not keep the wicked alive, but gives the afflicted their right. He does not withdraw his eyes from the righteous, but with kings on the throne, he sets them forever and they are exalted. And if they are bound in fetters and caught in the cords of affliction, then he declares to them their work and their transgressions that they are behaving arrogantly. He opens their ears to instruction and commands that they return from iniquity. If they listen and serve him, they complete their days in prosperity and their years in pleasantness. But if they do not listen, they shall perish by the sword and die without knowledge. The wicked in heart cherish anger. They do not cry for help when he binds them. They die in their youth and their life ends in shame. He delivers the afflicted by their affliction and opens their ear by ad adversity. He also allured you out of distress into a broad place where there was no constraint. And that was set on your table. What was set on your table was full of fatness. But you are obsessed with the case of the wicked. Judgment and justice seize you. Beware that wrath does not entice you into scoffing. And do not let the greatness of the ransom turn you aside. Will your cry avail to keep you from distress? Or will all the force of your, of your, of your strength? Do not long for the night when peoples are cut off in their place place beware do not turn to iniquity because of that you have been tried by affliction see elohim is exalted in his power who is a teacher like him <clears throat> who has prescribed for him his way or who can say you have done wrong remember to extol his work of which mortals have sung 
All people have looked on it. Everyone watches it from far away. Surely Elohim is great, and we do not know him. The number of his years is unsearchable. For he draws up the drops of water. He distills his mist and rain, which the skies pour down and drop upon mortals abundantly. Can anyone understand the spreading of the clouds, the thunderings of his pavilion? See, he scatters his lightnings around him and covers the roots of the sea. For by these he governs peoples, he gives food in abundance, he covers his hands with the lightning and commands it to strike the mark. It's crashing, tells about him. He is jealous with anger against iniquity. Job 37. At this also my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Listen, listen to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes out from his mouth. Under the whole heaven, he lets it loose and is lightning to the corners of the earth. After it, his voice roars. He thunders with his majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. Elohim thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. And the shower of rain, his heavy shower of rain, serves as a sign on everyone's hand, so that all whom he has made may know it. Then the animals go into their lairs and remain in their dens. From its chamber comes the whirlwind and cold from the scattering winds. By the breath of Elohim, ice is given and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn round and round by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. Hear this, O Job. Stop and consider the wondrous works of Elohim. Do you know how Elohim lays his command upon them and causes the lightning of his cloud to shine? Do you know the balancings of the clouds, the wondrous works of the one whose knowledge is perfect? You whose garments are hot when the earth is still because of the south wind, can you like him spread out the skies hard as a molten mirror? Teach us what we shall say to him. We cannot draw up our case because of darkness. Should he be told that I want to speak? Did anyone ever wish to be swallowed up? Now, no one can look on the light when it is bright in the skies, when the wind has passed and cleared them. Out of the north comes golden splendor. Around Elohim is awesome majesty. The Almighty, we cannot find him. He's great in power and justice and abundant righteousness he will not violate. Therefore, mortals fear him. He does not regard any who are wise in their own conceit. And then we take the final discourse, the only one that ultimately matters. Job 38. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind. Who is this that darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you shall declare to me. Where were the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone when the morning stars sang together and all the heavenly beings shouted for joy? Or who shut in the sea with doors when it burst out from the womb? When I made the clouds its garment and thick darkness its swaddling band and prescribed bounds for it and set bars and doors and said, thus far shall you come and no further. And here shall your proud ways be stopped. Have you commanded the morning since your days began and caused the dawn to know its place so that it might take hold of the skirts of the earth and the wicked be shaken out of it? It is changed like clay under the seal and it is dyed like a garment. Light is withheld from the wicked and their uplifted arm is broken. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recesses of the deep? Have the gates of death been revealed to you? Or have you seen the gates of deep darkness? Have you comprehended the expanse of the earth? Declare, if you know all this. Where is the way to the dwelling of light? And where is the place of darkness? That you may take it to its territory and that you may discern the paths to its home. Surely you know, for you were born there and the number of your days is great. Have you entered the storehouses of the snow? Or have you seen the storehouses of the hail, which I've reserved for the time of trouble, for the day of battle and war? What is the way to the place where the light is distributed or where the east wind is scattered upon the earth? 
Who has cut a channel for the torrents of rain and a way for the thunderbolt to bring rain on the land where no one lives, on the desert which is empty of human life, to satisfy the waste and desolate land and to make the ground put forth grass? Has the rain a father? Or who has begotten the drops of dew? From whose womb did the ice come forth? And who has given birth to the hoarfrost of heaven? The waters become hard like stone and the face of the deep is frozen. Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion? Can you leap forth the Maseroth in the season? Or can you guide the bear with its children? Do you know the ordinances of the heavens? Can you establish their rule on the earth? Can you lift up your voice to the clouds so that a flood of waters may cover you? Can you send forth lightning so that they may go and say to you, here we are? Who has put wisdom in the inward parts to give an understanding to the mind? Who has the wisdom to number the clouds? Or who can tilt the water skins of the heavens when the dust runs into a mass and the clods cling together? Can you hunt the prey for the lion or satisfy the appetite of the young lions when they crouch in their dens or lie in wait in their covert? Who provides for the raven its prey when its young ones cry to Elohim and wander about for lack of food? Do you know when the mountain goats give birth? Do you observe the calving of the deer? Can you number the months that they fulfill? And do you know the time when they gave birth? When they crouch to give birth to their offspring and are delivered of their young, their young ones become strong, they grow up in the open, they go forth and do not return to them. Who has let the wild ass go free? Who has loosed the bonds of the swift ass to which I have given the step for its home, the salt land for its dwelling place? It scorns the tumult of the city. It does not hear the shouts of the driver. It ranges the mountains as its pasture and it searches after every green thing. Is the wild ox willing to serve you? Will it spend the night at your crib? Can you tie it in the furrow with ropes? Or will it harrow the valleys after you? Will you depend on it because its strength is great? And will you hand over your labor to it? Do you have faith in it that it will return and bring your grain to the threshing floor? And as you can see, we've entered into chapter 39. I, th I don't think I mentioned it. The ostrich's wings flap wildly, though its pinions lack plumage, for it leaves its eggs to the earth and lets them be warmed on the ground, forgetting that a foot may crush them and that a wild animal may trample them. It deals cruelly with its young as if they were not its own, though its labor should be in, in vain, yet it has no fear, because Elohim has made it forget wisdom and given it no share in understanding. When it spreads its plumes aloft, it laughs at the horse and its rider. Do you give the horse its might? Do you clothe its neck with mane? You make it leap like the locust. Its majestic snorting is terrible. It paws violently, exults mightily. It goes out to meet the weapons. It laughs at fear and is not dismayed. It does not turn back from the sword. Upon it rattle the quiver, the flashing spear, and the javelin. With fierceness and rage, it swallows the ground. It cannot stand still at the sound of the trumpet. When the trumpet sounds, it says, aha. From a distance, it smells the battle, the, sun, the thunder of the captains. And the shouting is it by your wisdom that the hawk soars and spreads its wings towards the south is it at your command that the eagle mounts up and make its nest on high it lives on the rock and makes its home in the fastest of the rocky crag from there it spies the prey its eyes see it from far away the young ones suck up blood and where the slain are there it is job 40 <clears throat> and yahweh said to job Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Anyone who argues with Elohim must respond. <clears throat> then Job answered Yahweh, See, I am of small account. What shall I answer you? I lay my hand on my mouth. I've spoken once, and I will not answer. Twice, but will proceed no further. Then Yahweh answered Job out of the whirlwind. Gird up your loins like a man. I will question you and you declare to me. Will you even put me in the wrong? Will you condemn me that you may be justified? Have you an arm like Elohim and can you thunder with a voice like his? Deck yourself with majesty and dignity. Clothe yourself with glory and splendor. Pour out the overflowings of your anger and look on all who are proud and abase them. Look on all who are proud and bring them low. Tread down the wicked where they stand. Hide them all in the dust together. Bind their faces in the world below. Then I will also acknowledge to you that your own right hand can give you victory. Look at Behemoth, which I made just as I made you. 
it eats grass like an ox. Its strength is in its loins and its power in the muscles of its belly. It makes its tail stiff like a cedar. The sinews of its thighs are knit together. The bones are tubes of bronze, its limbs like bars of iron. It is the first of the great acts of Elohim. Only its maker can approach it with the sword. For the mountains yield food for it, where all the wild animals play. Under the lotus plants, it lies in the covert of the reeds and in the marsh. The lotus trees cover it for shade. The willows of the wadi surround it. Even if the river is turbulent, it is not frightened. It is confident, though Jordan rushes against its mouth. Can one take it with hooks or pierce its nose with a snare? Can you draw out Leviathan with a fish hook or press down its tongue with a cord? Can you put a rope in its nose or pierce its jaw with a hook? Will it make many supplications to you? Will it speak soft words to you? Will it make a covenant with you to be taken as your servant forever? Will you play with it as with a bird? Or will you put it on a leash for your girls? Will traders bargain over it? Will they divide it up among the merchants? Can you fill its skin with harpoons or its head with fishing spears? Lay hands on it. Think of the battle. You will not do it again. Any hope of capturing it will be disappointed. We're not even the Elohim of lump at the sight of it. No one is so fierce as to dare to stir it up. Who can stand before it? Who can confront it and be safe under the whole heaven? Who? I will not keep silence concerning its limbs or its mighty strength or its splendid frame. Who can strip off its outer garment? Who can penetrate its double coat of mail? Who can open the doors of its face? There is terror all around its teeth. Its back is made up of shields and rows, shut up closely as with a seal. One is so near to another that no air can come between them. They are joined one to another. They clasp each other and cannot be separated. Its sneezes flash forth light, and its eyes are like the eyelids of the dawn. From its mouth go flaming torches, sparks of fire leap out. Out of its nostrils comes smoke, as from a boiling pot and burning rushes. Its breath kindles coals and a flame comes out of its mouth. In its neck abides strength and terror dances before it. The folds of its flesh cling together. It is firmly cast and immovable. Its heart is as hard as stone, as hard as the lower millstone. When it raises itself up, the Elohim are afraid at the crashing they are beside themselves. Though the sword reaches it, it does not avail, nor does the spear, the dart, or the javelin. It counts iron as straw and bronze as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make it flee. Sling stones for it are turned to chaff. Curbs, excuse me, clubs are counted as chaff. It laughs at the rattle of javelins. Its underparts are like sharp, sharp potsherds. It spreads itself like a threshing sledge on the mire. It makes a deep boil like a pot. It makes the sea like a pot of ointment. It leaves a shining wake behind it. One would think the deep to be white-haired. On earth it has no equal, a creature without fear. It surveys everything that is lofty. It is king over all that are proud. Job 42. Then Job answered Yahweh, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand. Things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I have heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. After Yahweh had spoken these words to Job, Yahweh said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against you and against your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore, take seven bulls and seven rams, and go to my servant Job and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept his prayer not to deal with you according to your folly, for you have not spoken to me what is right, as my servant Job has done. So Eliphaz the Temanite and Bildad the Shuhite and Zophar the Namathite went and did what Yahweh had told them, and Yahweh accepted Job's prayer. And Yahweh restored the fortunes of Job when he had prayed for his friends. Let's say the blessings, not the fortunes. So I'm not crazy about that term. And Yahweh restored the blessings of Job when he had prayed for his friends. And Yahweh gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before. And they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that Yahweh had brought upon him. 
and each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. Yahweh blessed the latter days of Job more than its beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, a thousand yoke of oxen, and a thousand donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuk. In all the land, there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 150, four, excuse me, 140 years and saw his children and his children's children four generations. And Job died old and full of days. Wow. It's a tough one to get through, huh? It's a lot, it's a lot of material. And it's not easy to read. Because remember that it's poetry, right? It's it's um it's narrative and poetry. It's actually a, a bunch of different genres uh, in uh, in one. So let, let's talk a little bit about the book of Job overall. What is the purpose of Job? Well, first of all, it's wisdom literature, right? And the purpose of wisdom literature is to teach a very practical form of wisdom. It's not wisdom as you would find, for example, among the Greeks or the Babylonians, right? It's not, it's not just a theoretical type of wisdom. All wisdom in the scriptures, whether it's Proverbs, uh, Psalms, Job, etc., all wisdom is meant to, to be put to practical use. So the idea, Ecclesiastes and others, Song of Songs. So uh, the idea is to give you um, sayings or narratives or parables or metaphor right you, you might look at job as one one giant parable right uh it doesn't mean that i don't believe job was an actual person i actually believe he was a person uh, i believe that looking at the structure of job the way it's written etc i believe that it was it was probably about a person but written in a using job as the example as the as the hero the antagonist and then it was given a structure that was more literary in nature, that was to, to, to serve as somewhat of a of large parable, right? Um, matter of fact, let me just show you here um, a couple of things. So we're gonna, we're gonna go to different places here, just kind of settle in and we'll take this easy. Like I said, I, I don't need to finish this today. So if we need to, I wanna take it slow uh, and then we'll see where we are at the end of it. So if we go over to, I mentioned last week that, um, in Genesis, that uh, that there's a name in there that looks similar to Job's, but I didn't make a big deal out of it because it's probably not referring to Job. As a matter of fact, it's not even Job. It's 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 Eov as opposed to Yov. Uh, but uh, but some people think that that Job was a person who lived during the time of the of the patriarchs, and that does show evidence of a similar type name. So it may not be referring to Job per se, but it may that the fact that the name is similar may indicate that it was a name that was that was used during the time of the patriarchs. Another thing that we, we don't see here is, was Job an Israelite? We don't know that, we assume that, but there's no evidence. He's from something called the land of Uz, which I don't know that we know a whole lot about, but I don't, he, he's not necessarily presented as an Israelite per se. Well, were non-Israelites worshipers of Yahweh? Absolutely. Uh, Non-Israelites non knew Yahweh. As a matter of fact, if you look at, I'm not saying he was a Moabite, but if you look at something known as the Misha Sili from King Misha of Moab, Misha, M-E-S-H-A, uh, in the name of, in, in the, on the Moabite Sili, you see the name of Yahweh prominently used in the Moabite Sili. So Yahweh was well known and there were others who knew of him. Uh, but, uh, it's, but it's not important whether he was an Israelite uh, or, uh, or a, uh, of, among the nations. The point was that he was a righteous man and blameless, and he followed and served Yahweh. Um, if we go over to, let me hold my place there, and let's take a look at uh, Ezekiel 14, verse 14. So this is Ezekiel. Uh, we'll go to 12 for, verse 12 for context. So Ezekiel 14, 12, the word of Yahweh came to me, mortal son of man, when the land uh, when a land when when a land sins against me by acting faithlessly, and I stretch out my hand against it and break its staff of bread and send famine upon it and cut off from it human beings and animals, 
Even if Noah, Daniel, and Job, these three were in it, they would save only their own lives by their righteousness, says Yahweh Elohim, right? So these were three men that obviously were described in the scriptures as being blameless, right? You see, you see that of all three of these men, and there were others, but these three were specifically singled out as being righteous and blameless. So this leads me to believe, okay, it's very possible that he was an actual human being, right? An actual person that lived. You know, someone can make the case, well, maybe this, this is just a literary device that Ezekiel is using, right? That even if Noah, Daniel, and Job from, you know, from, from the stories, right, in that sense, I don't, I don't think so. I, you know, I, I just, it's, it's my belief that Job would have been an actual person as these two are actual people. There's one other place to look, but that's just my opinion, right? I could never, you know, never necessarily prove that. Um, he's mentioned once again. Uh, James 5, hopefully everybody can see that, James 5.11. So let's take 10 for example, uh, context. <clears throat> As an example of suffering and patience, beloved, take the prophets who spoke in the name of Yahweh. Indeed, we call blessed those who show endurance. You have heard of the endurance of Job and you have seen the purpose of Yahweh. How Yahweh is compassionate and merciful. So again, does that mean that he was that he's just being referred to in reference to the book in the scriptures that that bears his name, or that he was a real person? Well, you know, we'll ask Yahweh when we when we see him, right? But the bottom line is that whether he was a real person or just a, used as a metaphor, this this account was crafted for very important lessons, and. Um, some scholars think that this was done as that the whole book of Job is sort of a thought experiment, right? What is a thought experiment? Well, a thought experiment is you're just kind of doing amusing, M-U-S-I-N-G, amusing of a particular idea or concept um, where you're looking at the pros and cons and you're looking at the different aspects of it and coming up with a decision on what it all means. So if this is a thought experiment about the nature, for example, of justice, right, or the nature of righteousness, which are the two main areas that are covered prominently throughout the entire book, then it could have been a thought experiment using uh, Job as a literary device to be able to do this account of his life. You know, it could be, for example, that it, like, like so much that becomes legend, that there is a, an element of truth of a man of named Job who suffered some very serious things and went through stuff, maybe not exactly like it's happening there uh, in, in, literal, in a literal sense, but a man who suffered, but maintained his righteousness and integrity. And then you use that well-known account in oral history of that individual to then craft something around him, right? It's like if we would take, you know, someone like William Wallace, you know, of, uh, of Scotland, and there's all, all kinds of legend around William Wallace so you take the guy and, you know, there's probably a kernel of truth and everything that you see in the movie Braveheart that you read about him, et cetera. But of course, a whole legend you know, develops around him. And then you can use that to talk about bravery and courage and everything else. It doesn't take anything away from, from him. It just uses him as an example because of the things that happened to him in his life. So scholars, some scholars think it's, it's a thought experiment. But anyway, uh, let's look a little bit at the, at the structure of the book, because I think that that's going to help us to uh, to envision what's going on here. So we'll start with, uh, let me pull up a book here that I have. Okay, so you should see in just a moment, <clears throat> a copy of uh, this, the book that I've been using to, to guide me in the study called How to Read Job, appropriately, <laughs> by John H. Walton and Tremper Longman III. And this is the chart. It doesn't, uh, sadly, it doesn't uh, present as well here and electronically, um, I have a nice, nice looking chart. This is kind of a one pager in the book itself. So if you ever want to pick up a, a copy of that in the paperback, in the paperback version, I don't know if you can see that well. Okay, it's a nice little chart that gives you the, the structure of the book of Job, but I'll try to explain it as best I can here. So <clears throat> there are two narrative frames. Uh, a narrative has a narrator, right? So it's, the story is, is being narrated by somebody. We don't know exactly who that is, right? Whoever the author is. And then the narrator begins the book and ends the book, okay? So you notice that. So when we started, 
you have chapters one through three, which presents one bookend of the frame, right? And then you have the opposite end, which is what we just completed in, uh, in chapter 42, which is the narrative frame, which is sort of, you know, the ending of you know, Job's statement when he finally declares that he's repenting and he, he trusts in Yahweh, and then the epilogue. Uh, and it's interesting because in that narrative, it starts off with a description of heaven and earth, right? So you have a description of Job on the earth doing his thing, and then it jumps over to uh, a description of a meeting in the heavenly court. It's almost like a trial that's going on. People talk all the time, bandying back and forth what that uh, what that account is of the meeting of these these uh, these heavenly this heavenly court. And uh, first of all, um, uh, we we don't know, right? I mean, some people think it's a feast day or whatever. Um, and um, and you know there are all kinds of speculation, but we don't we don't know the speculation necessarily. We we can't confirm any of it one way or the other. It's just you know what whatever interpretation you have of that, you sort sort of superimpose that in your understanding upon what's going on there. I even have argued in the past, and I'm not convinced entirely that I'm wrong, uh, because I uh, I have I have reasons that I won't go into today because I don't have time. But I'm not even sure that that heavenly court is actually taking place in heaven, right? Um, and um, because it doesn't really say that, we're just kind of assuming that because of the, the, the folks who are there, right? So if we go back to the text, so he starts off talking about Job, right? A man in the land of us. So obviously this is earth. And then it says in 1.6, one day the heavenly beings <clears throat> came to present themselves before Yahweh and say, in all when you is that it's in heaven, but it doesn't say that, right? It says they're heavenly beings. It doesn't say where they came to present themselves. We just we're just assuming that they that they did it in heaven. So um, so we don't we don't really know that it's in heaven, right? And then you know people will assume. Well, you always said to Satan, "Where have you come from?" He said, "From going to and fro on the earth and from walking up and down on it." And the immediate assumption is that okay, well, you know, if he's if he was coming. He's been going to and fro from the earth, and now he's in heaven, and that's why he's explaining he's been on the earth. That's not necessarily so. He could have been just on the earth. So anyway, there are reasons again that I that I, I question that, but at least there's an implication that there's a heavenly audience, right? Which, which are these beings, and 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 then the reflection of that towards the end, of course, Yahweh speaking to Job, presumably from heaven, right? Or this, you know, as I've explained it, this breaking through this this veil between heaven and earth, right? So I don't want to force that, that interpretation of heaven and earth, because it, it's, it's sort of reading into this text, right? But you have, uh, but, but the bottom line is that the narrative gives you a similar view, right? Whether, whether it's heaven and earth, or whether it's just the heavenly being interacting with the earth, right? You see that both in the beginning and the very end. So it's like a bookend. So it's, it's a, it's a frame there. Okay, let me go back to the um, the book, and then the the main section in between everything, and that and by the way, that encompasses uh, ch uh, chapters one to three, right? Because you have you know it starts off with Job, then it switches to the heavenly the heavenly court scene, or the court scene among heavenly beings. Let's put it that way, and then back to Job, and then at the very end. It's Job's closing statement, and then again, interaction, let's say, between heaven and earth. And then in between all this is, of course, the main section of the book, which goes like this. So you have three cycles, as I've described it, <clears throat> um, of dialogue, talking back and forth. So you have, uh, after Job gives his opening lament, this first cycle starts with the three friends. So you have Eliphaz, and then Job speaks. So Eliphaz says something, and Job responds. Then Bildad is Bildad's turn. Then Job responds. Then Zophar's turn, Job responds. Cycle two, for, and that was chapters four to 14. Chapters 15 to 21, Eliphaz again, Job, Bildad, Job, Zophar, Job. And then by the time you get to cycle three, which is 22 to 27, notice you have Eliphaz, Job, Build that job. Where's Zophar? Zophar is nowhere to be found. Why? Well, 
we'll come back to that. Then you have this interlude that I described, which is the wisdom song, let's say, the wisdom song, Job 28, which I believe is the key center of this whole business. So it's kind of a pivot point. And then you go into the three discourses. So the first one, the first in the series, Job 29 to 31, is Job himself speaking. And he's speaking directly to Elohim. At this point, there's no dialogue because it's a waste of time. At this point, Job is speaking to Elohim alone. He's making his case. Reminiscences, affliction, and oath of innocence. Series two, Job 32 to 37, is Elihu, who is doing you know, his introduction, which is very long and very winded, right? This, this guy likes to hear himself talk, right? I'm going to speak. You guys should listen to me. I'm, I'm really going to speak here, and I'm going to speak now. I'm going to say stuff out of my mouth. It goes on for an entire chapter, chapter and a half. Verdict on the job, offend, uh, verdict on job, verdict on Job. So he, he gives a verdict on Job. The, he describes Job's offense in his thinking um, in chapter 35, and then he gives a summary of what he's coming up with. And then notice what's not here, right? Well, notice what's not here. Can anyone tell me, notice what's not here when you go to series three? What, what is not, Job doesn't reply, exactly. Job doesn't reply. And it could be because Job is just fed up at this point, right? We, we don't know, we're not told, it's speculation. If you're, if you're doing a sermon at this point, you're, you know, you're, you're offering an opinion maybe, right? Maybe he just felt, okay, this is just more of the same. I'm not gonna respond to this. <clears throat> Elihu, although his, his argument was rather winded, right? He, he made a few good points, but it was pretty much more the same what his friends were saying. But maybe the points that he did make were closer to what Yahweh eventually says, right? There were a couple of things that I noticed that were a little bit better. And it's interesting that when Yahweh speaks to them at the very end, and he's talking to Eliphaz, who's kind of, you know, kind of the de facto leader of the bunch, it would seem. It's interesting that Yahweh says, you and your three friends haven't spoken correctly, have Job, you know, pray for you. And Elihu is noticeably absent at the end. So what happened to Elihu? Who knows, right? It's not important in the book. But is it because he spoke well enough that he didn't merit, you know, having to be prayed for? Well, I don't know, right? Because he was pretty insulting to Job as well. And a lot of what he said was very similar to what the others said. But it's really not important to the ultimate thing. But Job doesn't answer. <clears throat> and then series three is Yahweh himself from 38 to 41 where he maintains his roles and functions in the cosmic order and the illustrations of specific things from the cosmic order, right? Behemoth, Leviathan, all the animals, etc. And he describes all this. And then that end frame with Joe's closing statement in the epilogue, okay? This is, um, <clears throat> this is, this, there is a progression here that occurs for, to tell the story and, and to, and for effect. There is a, um, something in, within literature known as a rhetorical strategy, a rhetorical strategy, which is really how you lay out a book, whether it's, you know, you do it with narrative or you do it with poems or you do it with, you know, how, how do you lay out narrative and, and the other elements of the book in such a way to convey the purpose of the book, to convey the themes, to, 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 to set a mood, <clears throat> to create an environment, and to ultimately show the points, the main points that you want to get across. That's a rhetorical strategy. So that rhetorical strategy is, is served well by the way that the structure is, is set up in the book of Job. You know, it's three discourse, uh, three dialogues. Then there's a pivot point <clears throat> where the story sort of changes and then three monologues and eventually a resolution at the end there. So it's very orderly in nature. So if anyone ever says to you, well, the book of Job is kind of all over the place, tell them you don't know what you're talking about. There's a lot of structure, there's rhetorical uh, devices being used in the book of Job to be able to convey this information. One, one of them I just described to you, the fact that it gets shorter, right? It's, it's, it's discourse of all three, then this, excuse me, dialogue, I keep saying discourse, dialogue of all three, dialogue of all three, and then all of a sudden we only have two. And by the way, look at that last one too. If you want to talk about rhetorical strategy. So with the last one, Zophar doesn't even speak. And okay, so 26 and 27 are Job. So just before that uh, would be Bildad. So so if you're looking at 24, uh, 25. Bildad speaks and look at Bildad's thing. 
it's very, very short, right? That's deliberate, right? So, you know, they're saying the same thing over and over again, as I described last week, right? There's really nothing new in their argument. They just kind of keep rehashing the same thing in a long-winded way. And finally, Zohar, Zohar gives up altogether, right? Because what else could he say? Bildad speaks, but it's like a little short paragraph. And then Job goes into his last re rebuttal to them. And that goes on for a couple of chapters. And then we go to 28. Okay. So look for these kinds of things in uh in, in, in the scriptures. Look for look for structure that helps to convey the message of the scriptures and, and nice little things like that. They're there for a reason. Like I've described the uh, acrostic Psalm, Psalm 119. I described the um Proverbs 31, which also uses an acrostic. So if you look at something like like uh, Proverbs 31, which I mentioned last week, the the Aishas Kail, <clears throat> the uh, you don't know this in, in English, of course, but in the Hebrew, every sen every section, every sentence within the Aishas Kail, the worthy woman, right? A worthy woman who can find or prices far above rubies and on and on. Every sentence in that, from start to finish, begins with the letter of the alphabet, right? So what is that? What what's the point of that? Is it just to be a nice flourish and just kind of you know was it total coincidence? Well, absolutely, it was not a coincidence. Was it meant just to be a nice literary flourish? Well, yes and no, right? Yes, it is, but there's it's more than that. What is it saying? What is what is the alphabet? The alphabet comes from two words, right? Aleph, bet, the first two letters of the Hebrew alphabet. Aleph, bet, right? The alphabet, and what it when we when we're talking about. Um, Exactly. When we talk beginning and end, we're talking about uh, the alpha and omega, which is which are the two, the opening, the beginning and last letter of the Greek alphabet, right? So when you look in the book of um, in in the book of Revelation, it talks about I am the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end, right? If you were doing that in Hebrew, I am the aleph and the tau. So if you have the entire alphabet that's used in Proverbs thirty-one for that section it's saying something right it's not just meant to be coincidence what it's saying is that this woman the worthy woman is complete from start to finish from beginning to end right <clears throat> psalm 119 every section alpha excuse me aleph bait gimel all the way through the alphabet again the law of yahweh speaking about the law of yahweh it's complete from start to finish and every sentence in each section begins with that letter it's a work of art, but it's also conveying a message, and this is what you're seeing also in the Book of Job and the way that it's written. So let's talk a little bit, of, and this is a little bit of review, but I'm going to mix some other stuff with it. Let's talk a bit about uh, what the Book of Job is conveying. So as I mentioned last week, um, the, the the common conception that the Book of Job, that the purpose of the Book of Job <clears throat> is to show us why human beings suffer. A lot of people have that idea about the Book of Job, that that's what its purpose is to show us why we suffer or how we should be, you know, uh, with regard to suffering or whatever. Well, that you don't find answers to that in the book of Job. That's not the purpose of the book of Job. The question in the book of Job, the prominent question in the book of Job is not why should we suffer or, or, or excuse me, why do we suffer? That's not, that's incidental, believe it or not, <clears throat> to the book. It's the vehicle by which we learn how to answer the real question. And the real question really is, what, how, why should, it's not why, what do we do about suffering or why should we suffer? It's what do we, why should we be righteous? Why should we be, what, what do we do about righteousness? And especially what do we do about righteousness? In other words, the way we walk before Yahweh, what do we do about our righteousness when things aren't going well? So if you think about the, the, the court case, if you will, that's going on in the very beginning in the, in the first chapter, the adversary is referred to as Hasatan, right, Satan. He is, he is throwing out a challenge, right? And, and it's a twofold challenge. The first part of the challenge is, is essentially saying, is an accusation that the only reason that Job is righteous is because you're giving him good things, right? 
he's serving you for the goodies. That's what the what the accusation is. So Job is a is a test case essentially for all of us, right? He's he's a test case for anyone who claims to serve Yahweh, right? Because this is these are these things are written for our instructions, obviously. So Job, he's he's he doesn't know it, but he is the actually he thinks that he is a he is a uh, uh, he thinks that he is a defend a, a, a um, what's the word I'm looking for in a court case um, a defendant in a criminal case, and actually he is not a defendant in the criminal case. You know, he thinks the criminal case against him. What he actually is, unbeknownst to him, is the star witness in a case against the true defendant, who is who. Yahweh. Yahweh is the defendant in the book of Job, not Job. It's not Job is going through, as the authors of this book describe, Job is going through trials, but he is not on trial. He is going through trials, but he is not on trial. The one that's on trial is Yahweh himself. And Job is the star witness. Because through Job, Yahweh is going to prove. And we can go through, you know, we're not going to talk about all the ethical considerations of, well, why does he have to prove anything to say, you know, that's, it's, it's this, again, if this is parable, those things are irrelevant, right? This is the means, a teaching moment for us. This entire book is a teaching moment for us about Yahweh's justice and about Yahweh's wisdom and his righteousness. So what's going on here is that, that Job is being, is he is the, the star witness to show that Yahweh uh, that that the servants of Yahweh don't do it just for the benefits, right? That people will, will maintain their righteousness and their integrity because of their love for Yahweh and not because they're necessarily getting anything in return for it. In other words, Satan's accusing him of being, in effect, creating little mercenaries, right? I'm using terms that we kind of are familiar with. I don't mean to make light of it, but that's it. Are you creating little mercenaries, right? That the only reason they're doing this is because you give them nice things. Take away the nice things and boom, you'll see very quickly that they only serve you because it's convenient for them because they're getting all these nice bennies from it, right? That's what the accusation was. And then the second question, the second accusation, there are two, and the second one is even more important. The first one is just to get to the second one. So the second main accusation <coughs> actually starts to occur it's not made until Job actually starts suffering, right? Because you see that there's, he goes through some stuff and then there's a break. He asks another question and then Yahweh says, okay, now you can touch him personally, right? The first thing, he, first time he was not able to touch Job's actual person. So he lost a bunch of things, including his family, but he didn't, he didn't have a, a, a personal physical stake in it. The second time around he does. And the question the second time around is, okay, is it right for, is it a good policy for righteous people to suffer? In other words, it gets to this, it gets to the, the idea of the, the, the tension between justice and, and Yahweh's righteousness and whether a person maintains their integrity or not. In other words, um, can a person who is righteous, should a person, maybe better better put, should a person who is righteous suffer at the hands of a presumably just Elohim? So if you want to boil it down to the essence, right, I'm just kind of going around here, but the, is, is, is Elohim unfair, right? Is fairness the, the criteria by which we judge Yahweh and how he runs his world? And if so, is he unfair? So I want to show you, I want to go back to the book here and show you a diagram, which is helpful, I think. So this, uh, they refer to this as the, the triangle of tensions. Okay, so hopefully everybody can see this. Uh, see if I can make it a little bit, a little bit larger here. There it is. Okay, so if you look at this, this triangle, there are three elements of this triangle. Again, this is from the book, How to Read Job. So one leg of the triangle is the retribution principle. I'll, I'll define these in a minute. The other one is Job's righteousness and the one at the top, Elohim's justice, right? So these three things, when everything is going right in a person's life, and let's just limit it to a righteous person right now, right? When, everyone's, when everything is going right, these three 
legs of the triangle are are in, in, in harmony, in balance with one another. But when something goes wrong with a righteous person, then all of a sudden, one of these is, is going to be out of place. The way that the that the ancient world looked at things, and one of the reasons that the book of Job was written, most people most you know people study it believe, is it was it was a reaction to the the Near Eastern idea of this concept here, the retribution principle. Well, what is the retribution principle? You're all familiar with it, but what is retribution? Retribution is when you get back at somebody, right? Retribution is like payback, right? So retribu the retribution principle essentially is the idea that, uh, that to boil it down to a very simplified way, that if you're good, you get good things in return. You're rewarded with good things. If you're bad, bad things happen to you, you're punished. And the Near East had that main idea. And I, I believe our current culture also simplifies things to a point where they take very complex things and reduce it to a simplified thing that doesn't match reality. And they, and they use that in the same way as people back then, they use that in our present day to judge Yahweh, <laughs> if such a thing can be done, right? But they do it. Retribution principles like, okay, Good things should only result in good things for good people. Bad things should result in bad things for bad people. And then you have the concept, of course, all these are closely related. The persons themselves, are they being righteous or no, right? And then you have here, ultimately, what it all boils down to is, is Yahweh's justice, is Yahweh just. So the so when so Job, each one of these folks coming to the thing have coming to this scenario have a different point of view of how all this is working, right? So Job maintains that he's a righteous guy. I haven't done anything wrong. And he's looking, well, I tell you what, let's start with the friends first. So the friends are strongly in the camp of the retribution principle, right? Uh, well, it's a, very it's a very simplistic way of looking at the world, right? So it's, okay, uh, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. Job, you're suffering. That must mean because you know that that's the retribution principle. We believe it, and we believe that the Almighty is just. That's not that's not in question for us. Yahweh is just. So that can only mean one thing, right? If if you're going through bad things and the Almighty is just, then the only conclusion that we could possibly come to, even if there is no evidence for that, is that Job, you must be a pretty bad person. So in their mind, this, this leg of the triangle is seriously deficient. There's no evidence for that. As a matter of fact, and we, as the, the reader, we know this, right? Because we know from the very beginning what's going on. Obviously, the friends don't know this. Job doesn't know what's going on because of the, the heavenly discussion. The, um, I keep saying the heavenly discussion. The discussion between the heavenly beings, right? They don't know. They, they don't know behind the scenes what, what, what has been agreed to. So in, in their minds, they only see what's in front of them. So, but, uh, but because uh, Job is, is, uh, is, is suffering, they, they think, okay, well, they can it can only mean one thing because in their simplistic way of looking at things, that must mean that you're a terrible person. And then of course, Job is not seeing that at all because he knows his life. He knows how he's been and he, he goes through, you know, most of the book recounting all these good things. Now we can make an argument as to, if he's a self-righteous person, right? Because he, he comes across as a bit self-righteous, but he's not wrong. We know he's not wrong because we know he's not suffering because of anything he did wrong, because we know about what happened in the discussion, in the court case. And we know that he's not suffering because Elohim is unjust, because we know that Yahweh is just. So Job doesn't know that, what's going on, and neither do the friends. So Job is thinking okay he's trying to he's trying to reason it out he's saying well i know i haven't done anything wrong but i also know that yahweh is just and he's in serious conflict right he also apparently believes in the retribution principle and that's that's the problem because he believes in all three of these things he believes in this balance and understandably so because that's what most people believe even today most people believe that but is it really true this retribution principle 
Well, not necessarily so, right? This, if, if, if the problem is gonna occur anywhere, it's probably gonna, be, gonna occur here, but there's another issue, the issue of Yahweh's justice. Upon what are we making a determination upon Yahweh's justice? If we're doing it based on the retribution principle, we're gonna run into trouble because we know that good people, that bad people as well as good, sometimes get good. And we know that good people as well as bad sometimes get bad. So you can't make a judgment about Yahweh's justice based on this retribution principle. But in this moment, this is what they're doing. And Job finally has to conclude in his way of thinking, because he can't rationalize it in his head, he has to conclude, okay, if I'm not doing, if I haven't done anything wrong and I'm not doing anything wrong, and if this principle is correct, that can only mean one thing. What is that? That Yahweh isn't just, right? It's a thought that's abhorrent to him, and you could see the conflict in him. You can see the conflict as he, you know, as he speaks to his friends. He's not really speaking even to his friends in those moments. He's really speaking to, uh, to, to himself and to Yahweh. And then in the, in the monologue, obviously, he's speaking you know, to, to Yahweh directly. But he, the, he, you could see the struggle. Uh, but, you know, I've, I've not done this and done this, and people do this, and the wicked do that, and they get away with it and whatever. But, but I know that Elohim is just almost like a person with a, you know, a split personality, right? Like you know, he's he's raging against everything, and then all of a sudden, oh, you know, but I know that Elohim is just. This just can't be right. This is Elohim does this. He does it. He refuses to accept it. But, but eventually, his conclusion is that you know what, Elohim's not just here. I I that's why he, that's why he demands to see him. I I gotta I gotta have an audience with him because I'm gonna set him straight. Something's wrong here. He's not hearing me. Whatever. I I need I need to go in front of. It's like you know. You ever had that experience where you feel you've been unjustly treated, and you say, No, 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 no. I can't do this by phone. I can't do this on you know by, by email or text. I gotta see the person. I got. They need to see me. They need to see my body language. I need that. We, they need to know I mean business, but they also I need to to give them the full right. I need to have the full experience. I don't know about you, but you know I've had that experience many times. If I've had an argument with someone ever, okay, no, no, no. We gotta see. We gotta. We gotta. Let's meet here and let's talk about this. We gotta do this in person. And that's how Job feels. And let me say something about how Job feels for a minute before we get back to this. You know, one of the wonderful things about about the Bible, in my opinion, is that the Bible is very raw in the way that it presents things. It doesn't hold things back. It doesn't pretty things up and put little neat, tidy corners. Right. This is why people. You know, sometimes get upset with the with the scriptures, or because right, because it doesn't pretty things up. If if people went out and destroyed a whole town, it says so. It doesn't go and try like some of the other ancient cultures that they'll you know hide things or whatever. No, it 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 just it's very blunt about it, and 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 you talk about it and you deal with it because that's the human condition. That's what you do. That's what they did. David goes and you know, he's a man after Yahweh's own heart. He has a wonderful, illustrious career judging Israel. And then he goes and commits adultery and murder. And there's not a shred of cover-up of that in scriptures. It's all put out for the world to see because there are lessons to be learned from that and David's repentance and everything else that goes on with it, right? And this is what you're seeing in the book of Job. This is what you see in the Psalms also. The Psalms are wonderful because they are prayers and they are prayers of different types. One, one of these times, Almighty willing, we should do a whole study on the book of Psalms. So that'll take a while. Okay. But the Psalms, there are many types of Psalms, including laments. And with laments, you will usually, there's a pattern of, of what's in a lament. And there's a lot of lament in the book of Job, obviously. The lament usually presents a complaint, a grief. The grief, the person's complaining in grief. And then there's usually in the laments in the Psalms, there's usually a almost a shaking of the fist at the Almighty, right? And I always tell everybody, don't do the shaking of the fist, right? But sometimes you feel like doing the shaking of the fist. And you know what? If that's what you're feeling at the moment, sometimes you can do the shaking of the fist. I think you want to tread carefully, but when you're, when you're in a really seriously emotional state, maybe you're not going to tread so carefully. Just try not to you know, overdo it, right? It's, it's hard to, to think clearly in an emotional state. But you see it flat out in the scriptures how how long are you going to look are you going to watch while i'm falling apart right but don't you see what they're doing to me how long are you are you blind to what's happening to me right you see that anyone who denies that doesn't read right so whenever you have people who want to tamper down 
your emotion when you're dealing with a difficult situation, you know, thank them for their concern and say, you know, uh, no, I think I'm going to follow. I think I'm going to follow the scriptures. And you, and if, if they don't want to do that, then kindly invite them to to sit. The scriptures recognize the full range of human emotion and frustration and all those things so people they're they're like desperately afraid to offend yahweh by are you kidding me this is the this is the creator of the universe this is the creator of the universe even his friends are telling him right well oh don't say that oh put your hand to your mouth right don't say that don't don't dare to right well no job is feeling it right he's 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 been we may not agree with that but that, that's coming from an intellectual perspective on our part, not from an emotional perspective, which are two different things. I've, as I've explained in the past, uh, head and heart <clears throat> are two different things. And they don't always convey the same thing at the same time. That's why when you go and dealing with a person in grief, that is not at all the time to go through a, 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 a scriptural treatise with them, right? That's not the time, you know? And uh, you know, let 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 them say what they say and feel what they feel because that's that is a a heart reaction. They're not thinking with the head. They're not thinking emotionally. Excuse me, uh, intellectually. They're thinking emotionally. We're all like that. That's the human condition. As a matter of fact, the person who is trying to just think intellectually in the midst of a situation of grief is probably not mourning very well. Because they're trying to put on appearances and they're trying to do an Academy Award performance for everyone when they're dying inside, right? So Job, let's not be so hard on Job. He's 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 feeling it and he's saying it and he's not afraid to say it. It's very interesting to me that at the very end, Yahweh says um, to uh, Eliphaz, he says, "You guys, I don't like what you've done. Uh, you've not spoken the truth about me. What else does he add to that? You've not spoken the truth about me, like." like my servant job has right well we know that joe's been saying a whole bunch of trash right he's been saying a bunch of trash and yahweh even calls him on it he says where were you when this and this and this and then so it's a very stern rebuke so job job hasn't said everything right so he's not you know we have to we have to look at that a little deeper he's not saying job has spoken correctly about everything but job has probably been the most authentic person there because he's not into this appearance mode and this let's defend the retribution principle and let's defend our position and let's defend uh you know good versus evil and job no 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 you don't know what you're talking about and that that righteousness that that's a self-righteous attitude to the extreme that his friends had telling him get what they were telling him right when you really think about it they were telling job job we know you had to have done something wrong because elohim is not unjust and because you know good is good and bad is bad right and it, the fact that you're not admitting it shows us that you're just covering stuff up and then job is like he's setting insult to injury right and job is saying to himself he's saying uh you know what I, it, first of all i've not done anything wrong and he knows his life and then second of all he's saying to himself well he's not saying so he's actually telling them saying you know you, you people don't know what you're talking about because i haven't done anything wrong and guess what neither will i break my integrity by admitting what you're telling me to admit it's like taking someone to court and i realize it's complicated but it's like taking someone to court who hasn't done anything and getting them to to admit to guilt when they haven't actually done something now there may be times when that might be advisable depending on the situation but that's beside the point the 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 main point i'm making is that if you're guilty and you go and you tell the judge that you're guilty excuse me if you're not guilty you're innocent and you told the judge that you're guilty you're 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 breaking your integrity because you're lying you're lying you're doing it for a lesser sentence or for whatever you know your motives we can we can debate the 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 ethics of your motives you know because maybe you want to go for a sure six months instead of 15 years that you could get if the trial is brought before a jury right like i say it's complicated but still understand what you just done you've just lied because you know you didn't do it and job says that he says i'm not gonna lie i'm not gonna lie to 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 us uh, to uh conform to some idea that you have about justice right some in, some some wrong idea that you have about justice i'm not gonna do it because then i will have i will be lying before 
the Almighty Himself. Then I will be breaking my integrity. So Job has been at least speaking authentically, and part of that authenticity is what? And this is the point that I wanted to make earlier. Part of that authenticity is, is crying out and saying, what are you doing here? What are you, you know? Now, be prepared to receive a rebuke if from, from Yahweh, if, if you, because I don't need a rebuke, like he's going to strike you down or anything. But, you know, he, he might move on your conscience, like he moved on Job's conscience. You know, Job was a lot more humble and meek when Yahweh said to him, mm, did you do this, did you do this, did that? And that might be an unacceptable answer to a lot of people. And they might have looked at that as, like I described last week, as Yahweh saying, you know, basically shut up and mind your own business. No, I don't think it's that at all. It's like, I need you to trust me because you don't know everything. You have incomplete information. You don't know everything. You weren't there when I did this and when I was doing that. And you don't know all the ins and outs of dealing with a, an animal and dealing with the, the sky and the thunder. And the, you don't know what it takes to put boundaries on the waters and everything else. So the fact that you don't know all those things, Job, so I'm kind of giving you an overview of the whole thing, right? The, the fact that you don't know those things, Job, can we, can we agree that the fact that you don't know all those things means that at best you have incomplete information? And therefore, I'd like you to trust me that I know what I'm doing. That is the interpretation, in my opinion, of that last section there. And by the way, I used to think the same way as everyone else. I was just like, oh, what is it? it's kind of, it's not really an answer, is it? You know, well, it is an answer. The answer is running a world is complicated. It's a complex world. And yes, even justice is a complex world. Uh, even, even maintaining justice is challenging in a complex world because you do one thing here and it affects something here and something's going on here and it goes right and we don't know all the ins and outs of that we we see in a very limited condition because of our you know what we what we are made of we're made in the image of elohim we're not elohim himself we reflect his glory we don't have his glory so you know we have to take it on faith that he understands the ins and outs he understands another way that the scriptures puts it is is he that Yahweh understands the end from the beginning, right? Which is very interesting because it it speaks to the the concept of time. The Yahweh is eternal. He's an eternal being. We are we are moving towards eternity, but we're not there yet. So if you're looking at it, if you want to look at it from a from a physiological eh, metaphysical kind of point of view, and trust me, I'm not an expert in metaphysics or physics, but it, 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 the way I would understand it is like if we're looking at a timeline. For us as human beings, we have a timeline going from here to here, right? What is our timeline based on, really, when you think about it? Very simply, it's not a trick question. It's not an abstract question. It's something very specific and practical that our timeline is based on. Can anyone tell me what that is? Just go ahead and pop it in the chat. We're, and we're going to end in a few minutes, and I'll continue this next week. Can anyone tell me in the chat, what is our timeline based on? Think about it for a minute, what you know, based on science and everything else. What is time? Nobody? Okay, how do we tell time? Right? And looking at this clock, and we have a, a minute hand sweeping, right? A watch, right? And what is a watch a representation of ultimately when, when, when you're looking at it? What is it? What is the concept behind it? Hours and minutes, right? Okay, that's close enough, right? Time, hours, and minutes. On what do we base hours and minutes? Ultimately, we base it upon the movement of the heavenly bodies, right? The movement for us, you know, for human beings, we, we do it based on the movement of the sun. So when you look at the ultimate origins of a clock, the ultimate origins of a clock is, 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 is the, the motion of the sun in the course of a certain time, right? It's, it's, and it's broken down to minutely to eventually you break it down into minutes and, and all that. But my point is that it's ultimately based upon the sun. And the and and the and the the, the turning of the sun and uh, the, the the revolutions of the earth, right? And, and I'm I'm probably butchering all this, but you know what I'm talking about. Is the, the movement of the heavenly body. So if you look at Genesis one, Yahweh tells us that He created the the lesser light and the greater light, essentially to tell time and seasons, etc. Okay, so we're all within that system of time that's based upon heavenly bodies, etc. Is Yahweh bound by that system? This is the point, the fine point of it. Is Yahweh bound by that system? Is Yahweh bound by what happens on the earth? No, Yahweh is the creator of the entire universe, right? 
I mean, the galaxies and galaxies and right billions of whatever. And right? so he's he's well outside that system. So if you're looking at our timeline, of course, it's it's infinite to say they see timeline is the understatement of the year, right? So if we are bound by that timeline, what else are we bound by? Space, right? So you, I talked about the interdimensionality between heaven and earth. We're bound by space, by time, and there are all sorts of things in the scripture that regulate space and time partly for that reason. So he's telling Job, you don't know what's going on in all these other things. So even a concept like justice to your, and he didn't put it this way, but to your puny thinking, to your puny limited understanding of what's going on with everything, would you presume to tell me what to do about how to how to run the earth, how to operate the earth? Or so so is it your your limited concept of justice? Is it your friend's limited concept of justice, the world's concept of justice by which I make my decisions? No, I base it on my wisdom. Because I know, because I was there when this happened, because I did this, I did that, and all these mighty beasts and everything, I created them and on and on, right? So if you trust that that is true, then that is enough or should be enough for you to say within yourself, when things are not going wrong, I don't like it, but I know that you are in control and you know what you are doing because you have real wisdom and this is what is at play we'll continue this next week our willing this is what is at, at play here back and forth between his friends between elihu between job right is who has wisdom who who whose word should we really ultimately trust and rely in here is it these individuals who are operating as if they know everything or is it Yahweh himself, who is the one who actually has the wisdom? And that's the point of, of, uh, of uh, chapter 28, right? So let's go very quickly to chapter 20, and I'll, I'll, I'll end it here. We'll continue next week. So when you get down towards the latter part of 28, but where shall wisdom be found? That's like, to me, that's the actual key center of the, hot, the entire book. Someone else might choose another key center, but that's where I would do it. Where shall wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? That's the answer. And that's where our trust has to be. And for a lot of people, by the way, especially now in our sophisticated day and age, that's not a good enough answer for people. You know what? I'm sorry about that. But that's the answer. We don't have to explain why there's suffering in the world. The book of Job doesn't explain why there's suffering in the world. There are, there are reasons that I can give that are potential, potentially part of it, but who, who can... Who can come up with the actual specific reason or reasons? Nobody. That's not, that's not the important question. The important question is, what do we do when we're in the middle of those things? And the answer simply is to trust in Yahweh's wisdom, to trust that Yahweh knows what he's doing and that he is in control. And like I said, I know that people don't like that answer, but that is the, in fact, the best answer. Where shall wisdom be found? And where's the place of understanding? Mortals do not know the way to it. And it is not found in the land of the living. And then he goes and gives some other descriptions here about you know, all the ones that think they have it and, and the value of it, and they don't. Where then does wisdom come from? And where's the place of understanding? It's hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Abaddon and death. Abaddon is, uh, is a term that means the destroyer. Abaddon and death say we have heard a rumor of it with our ears. And then he gives the answer. Elohim understands the way to it. And he knows his place. For he looks to the ends of the earth and sees everything in the heavens. He has the big picture. He understands the complexities of the world that he created. And therefore, he understands how true justice is meted out. You know, have you ever had an experience? I mean, just on a very limited level, have you ever had an experience where you were just so sure that you? You know that 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 somebody was you know was was doing a good thing or a bad thing or whatever and you were i mean you you had all the evidence in your mind and you talked to people there, and then you got a piece of information that gave you a complete paradigm shift and you thought to yourself wow i'm glad i didn't express this to anybody because i would have been laughed out of the room if you've never had an experience like that you need you need one for, just for humility's sake i've had experiences like that i thought i had i thought i had it exactly and everything was was right and um 
and then all of a sudden paradigm shift actually actually that's a frequent theme in, in movies is the idea that you 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 think that you have it all straight in your head and then and then all of a sudden you find out i i didn't i wasn't even remotely close to what the truth was in this situation that happens all the time and yet we as human beings we want to judge yahweh for suffering in the world and oh where was the almighty when this and then that, that i just i i understand people who say that um i i absolutely do understand that but i i uh, i cannot uh, uh i ca i cannot uh, i cannot abide by that that sort of attitude and by the way that to me that attitude that i just described is different than you as a human being or they crying out and saying why aren't you here why aren't you listening whatever but do it that way don't accuse and judge him like a like a like a coward to other people that's why job did it right because he did it directly to yahweh's face and he said father what are you doing right well he didn't call him father but what 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 are you doing do you not hear me david did the same thing over and over again just be blunt you think yahweh can't take it but that's what a person, you know, it's just like, I, I, I believe that that biblical ways of doing things are patterned after, you know, after uh, the way that you should approach Yahweh in many instances. So if we, if we have a, a process where you, you, you have the right to face your accuser, well, if you're accusing Yahweh, face him too. Face him too. Don't, don't, don't do a drive by, right? Like a coward. And go and, and and spit on his name in front of other people, but not go to the source himself. That I do not have respect for. You may disagree with me, and that's okay. We can have that discussion. But I think that that's what many people in this world do, religious and non-religious. I think that they 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 don't have the courage of conviction to 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 approach the one who needs to hear it. Don't be don't be afraid to go to him. That's authentic. That's what Job did, and he was. He was considered to be a, 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 in the right, having done that. So anyway, there's much more that I could say, and Yahweh yeah, willing, I'll have a chance to uh, to cover some of that next week. But uh, Book of Job, it's a lot. It's heavy. It's heavy material. So we'll do uh, just one more session, Father willing, and um, and then we'll move on from there. Hi everyone. Just one uh, one correction that I want to make on something that I said because I don't think you can wait. Um, when the, the the comment was made about uh, you know about people grieving and, and and striking out, I didn't mean to imply that when you when you're in grief that you're not going to talk to other people and grieve and and complain to other people about stuff. And if I did, that's not what I mean. My reaction was a reaction to you know to people who are mainly to people who are not religious who use suffering and pain in the world to accuse. Uh, to, to 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 prove quote unquote in their minds that there's no Elohim and uh and that they're uh you know that there's that there's no uh you know that there's no justice and blah 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 you know when people are in grief the truth of the matter is you're going to complain you're going to cry out you're going to say things that you don't necessarily mean and you're going to do it with other people as well okay so uh it, it, so that was not I did not mean that the way that it came out. So I want to make sure that I correct that right now. Okay. When people are in grief, they're not thinking. They're, again, it's a heart reaction. And people will, will, you know, with the levels of grief that they have, they're going to respond in very severe ways. And that's going to come out many times with all kinds of things, including accusations against the Almighty. And, you know, there, there's a right time to correct that, to let people know that Yahweh's in control and all that. That's not the moment to do it. Right. So just uh, just understand that grief is a very, uh, very interesting thing. And it's something that uh, it's worth further study in the future. So I just want to make sure that that I make that correction. So 